Hey everyone, welcome back to another build guide. So today we're here with the Dune Fletch Tornado Shot and I'm really excited to make this build guide because there is a lot to cover and um, I'm going to try my best to explain all of the mechanics as best as I can. I may not be entirely right on all of them and if I'm wrong about anything, please don't be afraid to point that out. And first of all, I want to credit a couple of people to, uh, you know, how I actually came to making this build. So first of all, we have Morph. I really think you should check him out. He's got a lot more detail on this build and uh, he does play a different variant to me. Um, and the one I have made is quite different. But at the same time, this is where I initially got the idea. So all the credit goes to him for most of the build. Second of all, we've got Captain Lance with the Vengeant Cascade Awareness. And uh, this made me realize with Tornado Shot, this would be really strong. So these are the two people that I think you should definitely go and check out. They've got really cool and interesting videos. And yeah, let's get into the build guide. So as per usual, I'm going to cover all the gear. I'm going to suggest budget options. I'm going to cover the links and then I'll cover the passive tree and basically explain why I chose what I did in certain slots and what you can choose if you want. Uh, and it's definitely an option for you. Okay, so first of all, I want to start off with the gear and we'll talk about Doom Fletcher's Prism. Now, Doom Fletcher's Prism is a really good bow, and the reason why it's so good is because of the last line on there, which is gain 100% of weapon physical damage as extra damage of each element. Now, this allows us to basically hit with all elements. We get to hit with fire, we get to hit with cold, and we get to hit with lightning. And if we can hit with all three elements, that means we can apply all three elements, which is um, ignite, chill, and shock. But since we are using a mechanic called Secrets of Suffering, we instead flick, inflict Scorch, Brittle, and Sapped. This makes it so that we have up to 15 base crit, we have up to minus 30 elemental res on the enemy, and we have up to 20% less damage taken from an enemy in which we hit. Okay, so now we've got that part out of the way. Um, let's go into, do you need a double corrupted Doom Fletcher's Prism? And the answer to that is absolutely not. You can easily, and the one I was using before was just a standard one. And uh, yeah, it's it's fine. And the reason I still have this lying around and I haven't sold it is because I am uh, going to double corrupt this one. Because I think uh, they're pretty good right now and not just my build is using them. So yeah. And I think, yeah, overall, this bow is amazing. And make sure you get Doom Fletcher's Prism. That's the upgraded version. There's a prophecy for this bow, which is just called the Doom Fletch, and you can upgrade it into the Doom Fletcher's Prism. Just make sure that you're actually using Doom Fletcher's Prism because it's very important. For the rest of the rolls, of course, you want as high physical damage as you possibly can get. But if you have to spend too much for that, it's fine. Just get any roll that will do the job. Um, luckily, the most important role on the bow isn't hasn't got a role, or like the most important mod on the bow doesn't have a role, which is the gain as extra. So, yeah. And now we will move on to the helmet. So, Asana's chant um, is the best insane bow helmet right now, in my opinion. The fact that you can basically spell sling or like automatically trigger or cast on hit basically with a with a bow uh, any spell in this helmet changes a lot so we're able to use sniper's mark and hydrosphere in here which allows for the vengeant cascade uh interaction with the anoint to actually uh work as we want it to without having to cast like an arcanist brand or put it on some you know cast when damage taken or something like that we don't have to do any of that and that makes it so much nicer. And yeah, it just basically means we only have to use Tornado Shot and Flame Dash in a map and maybe Val Grace. And we don't have to press any other buttons. It's basically a one or two button build, which, you know, is very desirable. And uh, yeah, so do you need the Helm Enchant? You don't, but I will say that extra projectiles on this build are massive. And this helm enchant is quite game changing. And I think this helmet is 5x. So if you're on a tight budget, don't go for the helm enchant. The helmet itself should be quite cheap, but the helmet enchant is very expensive. So just, you know, try and balance your currency. But it's not to the point where you should spend like half your currency on this helmet. That is not worth it because you need to buy other things. So yeah. 
Next off, we'll go to the quiver. So you really want a broadhead arrow quiver on this build, and it's the most optimal because we don't need any more crit chance um, since we scale enough on the tree, and we have a bit on the uh, quiver anyway, and we have, you know, a diamond ring too. To be honest, you know, the thing is about crit on this build, so we actually hit 15 brittle consistently on like a Cyrus, which uh, you'll see, or if you pause the video in the clips, you'd see that we'd hit like 13 to 15 brittle on the Conquerors and Cyrus. Um, so this means that our base crit is, you know, crazy. Like getting 13 or 15 base crit is going to cap our crit, even if we have a bit of crit. So the reason you still want a bit of crit regardless is because your first hit before you hit an enemy is not going to be a crit most of the time if you don't scale crit. So basically you want crit without brittle to make it so that when you get, or like getting to the point of having your brittle on the enemy is much smoother than not having it, if that makes sense. So if you have some crit without brittle, you'll have a much more comfortable mapping experience. So at the end of the day, if you want to go for a spike point arrow quiver, that's also fine. But I would recommend the fizz damage one, which is the broadhead, which is really, really good. Now guys, this quiver is really, really expensive and it's really annoying to make as well. So the one thing that I could budget you out of this bow or this quiver would be to get rid of the bow attacks for an additional arrow. Now this will substantially lower your damage, but you would still be able to get a pretty nice quiver. Alternatively, you could maybe drop another mod on here, maybe elemental damage with attacks or crit multiplier. But yeah, let me show you a budget uh, quiver that I was using before. It was this one over here so something like this um you know i could do all content with this quiver here so and look it's not even selling for 4x i've been trying to sell this quiver for ages so don't worry you can definitely get a budget quiver for maybe even 2x or 1x you know just uh the one thing i'll say i'll, I'll take back what i said earlier just you need bow attacks for additional arrow it's very important for this build because all your projectiles just add up the damage uh, and that's also another reason why we're going to talk about running greater multiple projectiles, even though we're using it for single target as well. So, yeah, that's the quiver covered. Um, and, you know, say you can't get a broadhead and you can't get a spike point. The one thing that you do not want is a arrow, arrow quiver or whatever the one that gives you pierce. Do not go for that quiver. Your bells are going to feel really weird if you do that. And uh, I haven't actually tested Pierce on this build, so it might be a disaster. So just be careful with Pierce. Uh, but other than that, you should be fine. Next off, we'll go into the talisman I have here. So originally, this was actually just an amulet, a citrine amulet to be precise. And then I Jorgen T3 slammed it. Unfortunately, we didn't hit anything good. You know, obviously, area effect isn't great. But, uh, you know, maybe for a cyclone build, this this is actually really insane. You know, like an elemental cyclone build or something. Because it has in, it has fizz damage, it has life, it has accuracy, it has wed, it has a resist. It's basically the perfect amulet. Uh, and yeah, this something like this should cost you quite a bit. Um, the one thing, like if you always want to save money, you always need to drop something here. So you either drop the accuracy, which is fine, but you're going to have to make it up somewhere else. You either drop the wed or you either drop the fizz damage. You need the intelligence. You don't pr probably need 55 and you could probably make up some intelligence somewhere else. But, you know, it's uh, a really tricky thing and you're going to have to mix and match which mods you can have and which mods you can't. Because I can assure you an amulet like this is not going to be on the market. And it was a true snipe when I got it. And yeah, just be careful with that. Um, and for unique amulets, I wouldn't really recommend any because you need too many stats like life and resist. And you can't really get that on a unique amulet as much. Uh, and if you can, you will be missing it out on something else. So I don't really recommend anything other than a rare over here. And yeah, guys, please remember, if you have any questions about the gear, please let me know. But I'm, I'm still going to be trying my best to give you the most budget options that you could possibly get. So I'm going to be telling you like what mods you can drop and stuff like that. So next off, we have our ring over here. Now this ring is a bit over the top, um, but I basically got a bit annoyed about my resist and I just bought something like this. Um, and you don't, if you get the these stats, right? Like this is resistant modified up. So if you get like a 40, 40 uh, res empty suffix coral ring, which would be the next best in slot, 
it'd be way cheaper than a vermilion ring. Vermilion ring is just way too expensive, so don't go for a vermilion ring, go for a coral ring, go for a two stone ring, go for something less. The next best is obviously coral ring because it still gives life and we need life to scale our damage and survivability, so make sure that you do go for coral ring if you can, but if you can't and you still struggle with the resist, don't be afraid to go for a two stone ring, that shouldn't be a problem. Next off we have here with another resist ring, another crazy resist ring, but the fact that makes this one really crazy is that it's got fizz damage on it, a T1 fizz damage roll, which is really, really strong for us, and obviously it helps give that more damage, and it even has crit chance, it's a diamond ring, so don't go for a diamond ring because it's might not be available and you should always 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 prioritize vermilion or coral ring it'd probably give you way more damage and we don't really need 30 percent increased crit chance from our ring here so i would recommend actually you know going for something a bit better than this in terms of life and uh, if don't be afraid to ditch the fizz damage to attacks if it's out of your budget and the other alternative stat that you can get that's not fizz damage to attacks, which is offensive, is elemental damage with attack skills. You can also get that on a ring. You can also craft it on a ring, I believe. So, yeah, just be flexible with your options. Don't be too stern on what I'm doing over here because you don't need exactly what I need or what I have. Uh, next up, we have the chest piece. Now, this is actually super easy to make. And as you can see, I still need to do some work on this. I'm still planning to um, basically veil this uh, Aisling slam this with increased max life and then craft life on it. So it's a gamble 50-50 that I'm planning to do. I'll do uh, suffixes cannot be changed. And then I will do Aisling slam. And if it removes additional curse, then I'll have to go again if it removes suffixes cannot be changed that would be the most ideal thing and then we would uh, unveil increase max life and then craft max life on top that would be the end game version of this chess piece um you know okay so how do you make this chess piece um now guys please please make this chess piece yourself it's like 5x cheaper to make it yourself or even more than that okay so first of all you want to buy a six link assassin's garb which is eye level 86 or higher, it could be eye level 100, that's fine as well. And then what you want to do is you want to uh, redeem a slam it. So what I did, yeah, so I redeem a slammed it and I all spammed for frenzy charge on hit because it had a higher weighting than attack crit, I believe. But I mean, yeah, so that's what I did there. And then once I all spammed the frenzy charge on hit, I bought another chest piece that just had attack crit on it that was clean, it didn't have any other hunter mods, right? So you need to make sure when you buy the other base, it doesn't have any other hunter mods and make sure you look for a roll that has at least 1.1 on the attack crit. Once you do that, you can awaken an orb, the bad chest piece with the attack crit onto the uh, six link assassin's garb redeemer chest piece. And then you will get uh, the two mods, which is frenzy on hit and attack crit. Once you roll that, you might roll an additional suffix you're kind of stuck with that uh, stuck with that suffix and i don't recommend trying to remove it because it's too gambly or it's too expensive if you do non influence to influence and you might still get a suffix anyway so what i'd recommend from there on is you would just uh do suffixes cannot be changed and then reforge caster and then it will force a additional curse but in order to do this you need to make sure your suffixes are full so if they're not full say for example you didn't have lightning res and you had just attack crit frenzy and some random couple of prefixes or something then what you would do is you would craft cannot uh, can have multiple mod uh, craft and modifiers which will fill the suffixes and then you craft suffixes cannot be changed which is a prefix and then you reforge caster and then you will force the additional curse once you force the additional curse hopefully you will have an empty prefix to craft some life and if you want to further go ahead and make this chest piece better you want to do suffixes cannot be changed and you want to ace link slam the chest piece which will then gamble 50 50 remove the additional curse if it removes the additional curse you want to go and do what i said earlier if it doesn't remove the additional curse and removes the uh you know suffixes cannot be changed then you can go ahead and uh, hopefully unveil increase max life increase max mana and then craft a life i'm sorry that took a while but I just wanted to explain how to craft that chest piece really easily. Okay, so this, that's like the, uh, a lot of the gear covered. Now we'll go into Pain Seeker. This is what ties the build all together. And this makes it so that we don't need to run increased effective element boots, um, which is really good. And it helps you run something a lot better and a lot different as well. So Pain Seeker, 
The main thing about these gloves is the last line. Inflict non-damaging ailments as though dealing more damage. So what this means is you don't have to deal as much damage as you normally would to apply an ailment to the amount that you'd normally do it. So for example, say for example, if we didn't have Pain Seeker, we can inflict five brittle, just as an example. With this, we act as if we're doing way more damage. And since ailments are based off your hit, that means that we can inflict a way higher brittle, right? So I'm pretty sure if I take Pain Seeker off, I can only inflict three to five brittle. When I put Pain Seeker on, I can basically inflict 15 brittle which is the maximum amount, which is absolutely insane. And I think these gloves are very slept on and people don't really understand how crazy this is. Now, the only downside to these gloves is that it doesn't have life, which is a big problem for us. But other than that, it's definitely worth using. Now, do you need the elemental weakness corrupt on it? You don't, you could go for enfeeble, you can go for temp chains. I would suggest getting a curse here because we have a additional curse. Alternatively, you can get a curse on your ring instead and uh, you can not run uh, any corrupt on here or you could run like a maximum frenzy charge corrupt. You know, something like that would be really good. You can mix and ra uh, match like where you want the Ellie weakness. You can do it on your rings or you could do it on your gloves corrupt or if you get it on your rings then you can put a frenzy corrupt on your gloves. So you can mix and match it if you can fix your resist and you definitely can if you don't use a unique belt. So I will talk about that in just a second. So next off, we have Headhunter and Rizlatha's Coil. So obviously, if you're on a budget, Rizlatha's Coil is an easy throw-in option, and you just use that, and it's fine. Uh, and you need to make sure on the Rizlatha's Coil that you go for the m uh, highest amount you can on the more maximum damage and the lowest amount you can on the less minimum attack damage. And this will give you the most damage out of the belt. And the thing is... Um, both of these might not be the best option, okay? So let me just explain what scenarios you'd use each one and then the alternative for even more budget or even more maxed version as well. So first of all, Rizlatha's Call is the easy option for me personally because you can switch between this and Headhunter without any stats being ruined, without anything being a problem. Because say for example, for mapping, I wanna use Headhunter, then I switch and I use Rizlatha's Call for like a Cyrus or something. So that in that way, it makes it really, really flexible. Now, because we already have our stats sorted, it also makes it flexible with a Stygian Vice. So if you don't want to use these belts or you don't like them or they're too expensive or you just want to use something else or you want to use something better, I would recommend a Stygian Vice. Now, on the Stygian Vice, you can get quite a few offensive mods. I think there is a video on how to make a really, really insane Stygian Vice. It's like got elemental damage with attacks. It's got projectile attack damage. It's got life. It's got resist. Something like that would be insane because that would allow you to run an Abyss Jewel, which you can also get further damage with life and you can get multi, you can get resist. Like a Stygian Vice is the best option here, guys, and I would really recommend it. Um, I'm only using these two because I'm lazy and I don't really want to make a Stygian Vice, but I would probably make a Stygian Vice for bossing uh, and ditch Rizlatha's Coil. But Rizlatha's Coil is a really easy, don't think about it version where you can just pop it on and uh, you don't need to make anything or anything like that. And it does the job, right? So yeah. And don't worry, Rizlatha's Call doesn't change a lot for this build. It's not game changing. You can run a different belt. Do not be afraid to. Even if you were to run a full life and resistage in Vice, you would be fine. You would lose some damage, but you would be fine. So yeah, just keep that in mind. And uh, we will go into the boots. Okay, so I got incredibly lucky with these boots, guys. And um, as you can see, they're pretty damn good. Uh, so what you want to do to make these boots is, uh, so personally, I didn't need Tailwind boots and I didn't need Onslaught boots. And uh, we rolled Onslaught on the Unveil here, but we didn't need any of the elevated shenanigans. And I, you know, an elevated Onslaught is okay, but we al I already have Onslaught on my bow, so I don't really need Onslaught uh, or anything on my boots. So um, basically what I did, I spammed Greed Essences on a Redeemer two-turn boots. And uh, basically what you want to do is hit, uh, you know, obviously the essence gives life and then you want to hit 30 or 35 move speed. In my case, I actually rolled elusive, which was completely insane. And because elusive is a prefix, I also had an empty prefix. 
So what I did, and I had an empty suffix, so what I did at that point was I crafted prefixes cannot be changed, that filled the suffixes, and then I reforged crit. Reforged crit allowed me to force elusive on, uh, sorry, I uh, I didn't reforge crit, sorry, uh, let me take that back a little bit. So I feel I did prefixes cannot be changed because I said I already had elusive on the boots, sorry. So what I did is I reforged, uh, I mean I veil chaos it, when I Veil Chaos it, I rolled the move speed because it was the only thing that could roll because I only had an empty prefix. And then I, uh, you know, when I Veil Chaos it, I rolled T1 Fire Res and Int and Strength. That's literally what happened. And that was the boots done. I got extremely lucky. And the reason why Strength and Int is really important because we actually want those stats, Strength for Life and Intelligence because we actually need it. So this just turned out crazy. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, we hit 30% quality in one perfect fossil and we also hit this uh, lab enchant with one enchanted fossil before we started all the, the crafting on it. Okay, so how do you actually want to go about making these boots? Uh, you want to essence spam until you hit 30 or 35 move speed. Once you do that, you want to make sure you have an empty prefix. And if you have an empty prefix, that's really good. Then you can craft prefixes cannot be changed, which is a suffix. And then you reforge crit to force on elusive. And then you would uh, do prefixes cannot be changed again, because uh, if you do that, then you will have elusive life and move speed. And then once you do that, you want to yeah, put prefixes cannot be changed. And then you want to reforge any elemental res that you want. So if you want fire, you do reforge fire. If you want lightning, you do reforge lightning and so on. And then hopefully you will have an empty suffix. And if you do, then you craft another resist on top of that. That's how you want to make these boots and do not buy these boots. They are so expensive on the market and greed essences are way cheaper to do it this way and if you can't afford that or if you don't want to do any of that just get some life and resist on the boots you don't need anything else like genuinely the boots i was using before and these are like overpriced as well and let me just reprice these anyway so these are what i was using on my budget variant you know okay it has 35 move speed you do not need 35 move speed it just has resist and life that's literally it so yeah that was the, the the thing I was using before. Um, and yeah, that is the, the gear covered. Now I'm going to go into the flasks. And um, yeah. So first of all, if you want to run Bottled Faith, you definitely can. And you can ditch may, Taste of Hate or Sin's Rebirth. But you might not want to. And I'll tell you why. So Sin's Rebirth, uh, I'm only using it for Anti-Ignite. And it gives Unholy Might, which is really strong for us because we scale Fizz. And it gives Fizz as extra chaos. So it's a pretty good damaging flask anyway. And the reason you want Anti-Ignite is because we don't have full ailment immunity. And uh, Anti-Ignite feels really good because getting ignited on this build is one of the worst things that can happen. As well as getting bled. But getting ignited on this build feels terrible because petrified blood makes it i don't know i don't know how or i don't know why but when you're petrified blood you just take so much more degeneration so that is why you don't want to get ignited and uh there's been times where before i had an anti-ignite i would just die to a monster hitting me with a really chunky ignite and i would just die so yeah, and it's almost instant, so you can't really react to it. And the ignite lasts longer than your life flask, so it's a bit a bit scary. Uh, next off, we have an anti bleed divine life flask, which is uh, really really good. Um, and it's instant recovery, which is actually really important in my opinion for this build, um, because you don't have much life, and instantly recovering like a quarter or a third of it instantly is uh, is very powerful. So I definitely recommend that. So next off, we have Taste of Hate. This gives Fizz as extra cold, which is a pretty nice stat to have in general. But not only that, it has the main stat on it, which is extremely good, is Fizz damage from hits taken as cold damage during flask effect. This is crazy good, guys. Uh, and I definitely recommend using this flask. But if you want to go more offensive, you can use a Bottled Faith and it should be fine. Next off, we just have a standard Quicksilver of Adrenaline pretty standard there and then finally we have dying sun this is the highest dps flask for this build on pob it's not going to say that but it truly is it is an insane flask and you have to use dying sun without a doubt in my mind so do use dying sun if you can it's really cheap nowadays not many builds are using it anymore and the builds that do already have them so just you know dying sun is the play next off we'll go into gem links first of all we have anomalous tornado shot Anomalous Tornado Shot makes it so that we get 
or sorry, 60% of physical damage converted to a random element, uh, which is really strong for us because obviously we're scaling a ton of fizz with bloodthirst support. And the fact that we get to convert that into a different element is really nice for us and allows us to scale our damage a bit easier. So I don't, and it also allows us to, you know, benefit a lot from Trinity because we're always going to be attacking in a random element. And uh, yeah, we get, we get uh, Doom Fletch for Trinity anyway, but yeah, the Tornado Shot is really, really good. And as you can see, it's only 60%. So to fix the problem of not having 100% Fizz conversion, we use Winter Spirit. And this gives us 40% cold conversion, which isn't ideal. We definitely want like elemental conversion. But the reason we are okay with cold conversion is because we basically uh, are allowed to run Fizz Reflect maps now because we have no physical damage left, as you can see here. I mean, it says we it says we do, but we actually don't. I don't think it's accounting for that on the tooltip. Um, by the way, uh, just a quick disclaimer. On the path of building, the damage is going to be insanely low the amount of invest i think the pob that i'm going to upload that my current build is in is like 1.7 million which is completely inaccurate if you saw my damage it's completely over the top compared to that and it's definitely not that damage so you're going to see on the budget variant of the pob that the damage is going to be quite low and please don't be afraid if it's low because it's not a true representation of how much damage you're actually doing and i'm sorry but i cannot calculate the damage on this build it's a really strange one to calculate next off we have a increased crit damage support now this is the best damaging support uh compared to elemental damage with attacks which is crazy that this beats it and the reason this beats it is because we have capped crit and any multiplier we get is just a more damage multiplier next off we have a uh, anomalous greater multiple projectiles ideally you want awakened greater multiple projectiles that's one of the upgrades i still need to do and um, we get the the reason we use anomalous is for the reduced mana cost and we used increased projectile speed which is both really really good stats so why is projectile speed good for this build? Projectile speed means that basically, as far as I understand it, is that tornado shots projectiles travel further the more projectile speed you have. And also having projectile speed is a huge quality of life for the fact that the projectile is going to reach the enemy faster. So that kind of helps your clear as well. So I do recommend getting projectile speed. Next off, we have Trinity support. This is just standard. This is the best support gem for us, and it does way too much damage. Um, this basically means that uh, we gain resonance because we're, we're doing all the types of damage, and we're just going to be gaining so much more damage and penetration because we have uh, the resonance all correctly done. Um, I don't want to go into depth for how Trinity works too much, but yeah, that's because we're, we're getting physical damage is extra over each element basically means that we can always proc trinity because we're always doing all the types of damage um, and they're all being done to a similar extent right so that's the important thing about trinity is that your damage uh, types like say for example your fire damage is really high but your lightning damage is really low that's going to ruin your trinity but if you have even fire cold and lightning damage or uh, even f you only need two for trinity so you only need like uh, you know, even fire and lightning damage. And if your cold damage is too high or too low, that's not a problem. That's why converting with Winter Spirit doesn't ruin our build. It's just the fact that our fire and lightning is even because of Anomalous Tornado Shot and Doom Fletch. Um, scaling all of the elemental damage or like Fizz is extra for all of the elements instead of just one. So, yeah. Next off, we have Bloodthirst Support. Um, this is really, really strong. The reason we run Anomalous is just for the accuracy. Now, you don't need to run Anomalous if your accuracy is fine, but in my experience, it wasn't, so I had to run this. Um, I don't even know if I need to run it now, um, but yeah, as you can see, yeah, I don't need it anymore. Uh, my hit chance is fine, um, so yeah. Bloodthirst uh, is also our, one of our highest, Like I think it's higher than Trinity as well. Um, that gives us the most damage. Uh, it basically just gives you flat fizz uh, equal to 2% of your maximum life, which is completely crazy because it allows us to scale life for damage as well. Uh, and yeah, the amount of physical damage it gives is just a lot. Um, and it allows us this whole build to work. Um, the only bad thing about this support gem 
uh, is that you have to be on low life and that's why we use petrified blood as well because we're going to be on low life anyway so petrified blood uh, helps us not die instantly on low life which is nice uh, and then we have a divergent inspiration support this is to reduce the mana cost even further. Um, it's just like the mana on this build does feel a bit annoying. That's why we're using all these tactics to get lower mana cost. Um, but you don't really need to if you're okay with it feeling a bit worse. But in my experience, I really like to shoot out like multiple times my uh, my my character's ability, even if I have leech, because it just feels a bit better. Um, but it's much more of a preference and quality of life thing than something you should actually do. Next off, we have a uh, culling strike in the helmet. Now you don't need diversion. It's just kind of a meme. It's just a uh, recover, um, you know, 2% of life when supporter skills cull an enemy. Now Hydrosphere isn't going to cull an enemy that much. So you're not going to get <laughs> benefit from the alternate quality. So don't go all out on this. Just get a normal, normal culling strike and that should be fine. And this works really well with Hydrosphere because obviously on a boss, it's going to be there and it's going to cull them. And it's really, really good. Next up, we have Sniper's Mark. Sniper's Mark is uh, almost a build of lightning, uh, you know, a curse gem in this or mark gem in this um, in this build. And it basically makes it so that your projectiles split when you hit an enemy, uh, which, you know, makes the whole interaction with this build broken, in my opinion. And then we use Hydrosphere. So Hydrosphere, in, in, what I believe it to do, and I don't know if it actually does this, but what I understand is that it basically collects all the projectiles that don't hit and it hits the enemy with them so basically you know how in ts we have such a wide spread of projectiles like that and it's really hard for all of the projectiles to hit the enemy but if you shoot this with the hydrosphere hydrosphere just makes it so that all your projectiles hit the enemy and that's completely broken and that's why this works so this is how it works right from my understanding we shoot a project we shoot our tornado shot Hydrosphere is, uh, you know, first of all, our sniper's mark is going to be spreading all the projectiles everywhere. And then after the projectiles are spread, they are going to return to me, uh, you know. And then after all of that interaction, the enemy has taken so many projectiles and taken so much damage. So that's how I believe it to work. But if I'm completely wrong about this, do let me know in the comments down below. And then uh, finally, we're running Enhance, which is going to be buffing our sniper's mark quite a lot so the default quality is curse enemies take five percent increased damage from projectile hits that is a five percent more multiplier and this enhance ups it to eleven percent which is completely insane uh, especially if you take into account what sniper's mark already does right it's a pretty damn good build enabling gem and on top of that it's giving an insane additional effect from the quality so this makes it just completely insane. So I definitely recommend that. Um, and yeah, so let's go into our body armor. So you don't need a six link, first of all. Uh, this is just a bit over the top. Um, and the reason I have a six link is because when you craft a chess piece like this, you want to resell it eventually if you want to change a build, right? So you don't want to make a non six link because you're just going to lose money at that point. No one wants a non six link chess piece like this. So you want to make the reason I suggested making a six link assassin's garb was purely for this reason. Now, a really good uh, thing about having a five link anyway, not exactly a six link, but the fact that you can enlighten all your auras on this build, which is really, really important because uh, we struggle for mana and we struggle for uh, no, we, we don't really struggle for life, but we definitely like for the life reservation, but we definitely struggle for mana reservation for it to feel comfortable. And the fact that I'm running a level one precision here because I have so much accuracy elsewhere, you probably are going to need to run a high level precision if you don't have enough accuracy. So this uh, within Lighten 3 would allow you to run a bit higher level precision. So we use Herald of Ash because it gives Fizz's extra fire. We use precision. We use uh, Arctic Armor. We, and uh, this gives us freeze immunity. We use uh, petrified blood, which is basically allows us to be quite tanky on low life. Um, but we do take, you know, quite a lot of damage from damage over time still. Um, and then we have enlighten on all of it and portal. So that is the whole thing over there. And that is all of our main auras that are on our mana. And I'm going to talk about our life auras soon. Um, there's only two to talk about there anyway. 
but uh or three but yeah that's uh that's that covered and um yeah so those are the gems in there next off we'll go to steel skin we've got we're not actually running grace we're only using val grace which is really really strong and i really recommend it because you can proc it basically at the start of any conqueror fight or at the start of any expedition and you'll be kind of immortal at least in my experience we use life tap on uh flame dash and steel skin uh, on Valgrace, I don't think it makes a difference, but um, basically I like to um, have my mana open. So basically if I spam my TS, I still want mana uh, for Flame Dash, or and I don't want to use my mana because my mana regen sucks. And say for example, um, I stand on like the Baron Square of Degen, if you guys know what I'm talking about. It drains your life and your mana, and uh, I like to flame dash out of it. And if I run out of mana, I'm just stuck in it and I can die. So I'd like to have that on life tab. It's just a huge quality of life and steel skin as well. Steel skin is really nice. We just run it on left click and it basically triggers on its own. Uh, it's not completely optimal because sometimes it won't be up when you actually need it. But, you know, it's better than not having it. And uh, yeah, that's what I think about that. Next off, we have our Boots Auras. We have Arrogance to make sure that we can reserve our life. We use a Herald of Purity because it scales Fizz damage. It gives us more physical damage, which is a very important stat. And then finally, we have Vitality. And uh, Vitality feels really good on this build because, yeah, you degen sometimes and this will counteract some of it. And uh, to make uh, Vitality even more insane, you want a Watcher's Eye that gives life gained on hit while affected by vitality, this will make mapping and just your life recovery on general feel really, really good. Now you don't need another mod, like I've got precision on here as well, this can be very expensive, but if you just go for the vitality mod, uh, it's still quite expensive, but it's definitely, definitely worth it. And uh, you know, obviously if you're on a very tight budget, it's not worth it, but it's such a good quality of life. Like the difference you will feel from having that washer's eye is huge. Okay guys, there was something that I really needed to point out about uh, Petrified Blood and the thing that I misunderstood in the initial video. Um, so there was a lot of comments and I would just quickly needed to point this out. And the fact that you need to uh, unreserve a, uh, a little bit less life than 50% just so that you can um, overleach, right? So we can never, unless we use a life flask, uh, go over our you know our life here and if we do go over our skill will use up that life to put us back on low life right so the thing is in this way we can basically make it so that we're permanently leeching if we have a little bit of life unreserved so we want like 51 percent unreserved it's really weird to to say it in words but basically we want a little bit uh of um space here between our life and uh 50 percent so the reason that works is because the game thinks we're always uh, not on full life and that will make it so that we overleach. So the solution to this is actually to just run a level 1 vitality or level 2 vitality over the level 7 that I was running or you drop the enlighten. You know, make it work in what way you can but make sure you have a little bit of breathing room between your life and your reserved life. Yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so that's the something I just wanted to point out. Okay, so that is all the gems covered. Um, and now I want to go finally into the tree and explain what my approach is or was with this. Uh, we'll start off with the ascendancy. So it does hurt to lose ricochet and we can't really fit it in unfortunately without losing a ton of damage. Um, so the reason why we don't take ricochet is because of Vengeance Cascade. Vengeance Cascade is supposed to help our clear so we don't really need ricochet. So I think that, um, you know, changing that out for the anoint and getting extra damage from the anoint is actually a better deal. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. And uh, we take far shot because we don't have, uh, you know, any other way of getting far shot. And far shot allows you to play from a distance. And normally on bow builds, you have to use point blank and go melee range with the enemy and just, you know, tank whatever they're doing. But now we don't need to do that anymore with Far Shot and it allows you to really play like a ranger and really allows you to just play safe. And I think this is something that GGG did really good with Far Shot. They made this is such a well designed thing for a ranger and I really liked it. And now we go for endless munitions, you know, two additional projectiles is crazy strong. So we definitely won that. 
Uh, then we take Gathering Winds. It's really, really good. It gives us Tailwind. You know, it's pretty standard and it gives us damage because of the action speed. And then finally, we have Focal Point, which, you know, buffing are already on Crack Sniper's Mark is, uh, you know, very desirable. Okay, so we path through the life over here. We take Heart of Oak. If you're struggling for stats, you might want to take Primal Spirit. Um, and I'll show you how I fix my int, but it's a very expensive option. Uh, and then we go and take Winter Spirit, obviously for the 40% Fizz Convert. We go ahead and take Wind Dancer. Now, the reason we take this node, now you don't need to take this node if you don't want to. Maybe you have an Abyss Jewel with phasing on your Stygian Vice, or maybe you have another way of gaining phasing that I don't know of. Um, but yeah, phasing is kind of important on this build because uh, basically you can sometimes have a situation where your Hydrosphere actually can block you and uh, and then because you're running king of the hill you can sometimes push enemies into you and that can you know block you so you really do want phasing uh in my experience is very worth it uh and then we take thick skin over here uh for some extra life and we take the whole wheel uh purely for extra life next off we go to herbalism to get more life we go here and we go down for lethality and primeval force now, obviously, this is com completely crazy high damage value, so you definitely want this. Uh, and then we go up and we take the whole uh, bow cluster over here. And you're probably wondering, if King of the Hill is such a nuisance, why do you take it? And the fact of the matter is that it just gives too much crit not to take. And it's not even to cap our crit entirely. It's mainly so that we can just have a good time in mapping before we have Brittle on the enemy, as I was talking about earlier. So I think that's very, very important. We go ahead and take Acuity for some accuracy. This really helps your accuracy. Uh, and we also run a Lethal Pride here. So Lethal Pride is crazy because it gives you so much strength. And uh, the fact that it gives you so much strength allows you to be more flexible with like your belt. So as you can see, Headhunter doesn't fix my strength. Lethal Pride does. If I take Headhunter out, it's giving a lot of strength, guys. Like a lot of strength because we have so many nodes here. So make sure you take the Lethal Pride. It's so good and it fixes a lot of your attribute problems. You have to remember we also have strength on our boots. So Lethal Pride is giving a unethical amount of strength over here. Now the reason we take this Frenzy Charge is only because we rolled Chance to deal double damage on it. I think this Lethal Pride is actually crazy because we also rolled Chance to deal double damage on Flash Freeze. Which I'm planning to take soon when I level up. So... Just keep in mind, this is a bit insane. And to be honest with you, if you don't have any good mods, that's okay. You don't need anything too insane. Uh, this is another good mod I have is Fizz taken as fire damage. This is completely insane. I think this lethal pride is genuinely worth quite a bit. Um, and we also have melee multi here on top. So for any melee build that goes here, maybe like a, a cyclone void forge build would benefit from this lethal pride as well. So, you know, it's um, it's pretty interesting. And we got a regen on here. Take forces of nature for extra damage. And we path down to revenge of the hunted for life. Uh, we take acro of course. Because we need uh, a defensive layer here. Um, now this cluster is really really good. Uh, what you want is feed the fury. Feel the fight and martial prowess. Now the reason you want this is because. Um, it gives. Now feed the fury you don't actually need the life leech. But we definitely want the mana leech. Uh, the mana leech is super super important. And uh, the reason why Feed the Fury is good, even if it didn't give Life Leech, is just the fact that we get the increased damage while leeching and the attack speed. 15% attack speed for one notable is completely broken and uh, it gives increased damage too. So that notable in general is just kind of insane. And then Martial Prowess to give us accuracy, attack speed, attack damage, and increased uh, damage with ailments. Uh, which we don't really benefit from so because we don't bleed ignite or poison so martial prowess on the third line doesn't do much but it's still a really good notable and i really wouldn't recommend anything else now uh to get this cluster um you kind of just want to buy it i don't know how you craft this one and uh you're probably going to have to get one that has like increased damage to stuff attacks but i spent extra to get the just increased attack damage so i actually benefit from the smaller points but that's a bit extreme um and yeah you don't have to do that 
Next off, we have Repeater and Streamlined. The reason we run uh, Streamlined instead of Eye to Eye, which is more damage, is first of all, Eye to Eye only gives you damage, uh, or most of the damage from the Notable comes from if you're close to the enemy, which we're not. Uh, and also streamlined gives more projectile speed, which is something that I really like on this build. And then we have repeat, obviously, just because it's insane. And then we take a, uh, a Secrets of Suffering with Corrupted Blood. Now, um, if you want a Corrupted Blood Jewel, uh, you want to get it on your Stygian Vice. That's like the easiest place to get it. Or if you're not using the Watcher's Eye, you can get it there too. Because getting a Corrupted Blood Interrogation is very expensive. I think I bought mine for 7x and I don't even think that's the right price for it. So I think it's going to keep going up. Next off, we run a Pressure Points Quick Getaway Cluster Jewel. Uh, this helps with a lot of crit chance and gives you chance to deal double damage on your crits, which is really strong. Next off, we have a Small Cluster Fettle, which, uh, yeah, the reason this is insane is because it gives 12 int uh, <laughs> per node. And this helps our intelligence problems without Primal Spirit. So this obviously is optimal. And uh, it's a little bit insane because I don't think it's very realistic to get 12 int per node. Uh, and it's kind of a snipe to get that. Uh, and Fetal helps with our life as well. And we go up to uh, Blood Drinker. The reason we don't need life leech is because of Blood Drinker. It gives us attack leech, attack damage leech. Uh, and then we go and take the Watcher's Eye over here. I know it's three points, but we can't really take anything else. There's no other efficient dual socket we can take. We go up to Fangs of the Viper. It gives increased fizz, move speed, which is really strong. Then we go and we take resourcefulness for a bit of life and tiny bit of res. We go ahead and take will of blades for the crit chance and the fizz damage, coordination for attack speed, life and assassination just for a bunch of crit and damage, uh, crit multi. So yeah, that is everything covered guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed this build guide. Um, I tried to explain everything to the best of my ability, but if there's any issues, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, hopefully I gave a, like more budget options and I'll leave a budget POB in the description down below. Please subscribe if you like these type of uh, build guides and you want to see more of them. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.